Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's who's joining us from all around the world. Been uh, <laughs> I was just telling IP I'm expecting something to go horribly wrong because everything today has gone horribly wrong in terms of uh anything involving a computer or editing or videos today has gone uh has just been going weird exporting stuff anyway uploaded the wrong video anyway um <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and try to do a little live stream now and for those of you who are looking for the uh muhammad meets moses you might have seen the um uh seen the uh seen it uh, announced earlier uh, i had to take it down that was a, a, a incorrect version that was missing some things um, so anyway, the correct version is uploaded already. I still have to fill in the, uh, you know, keywords and stuff like that, but I'll be premiering that at 11. So be sure to check back after we're done here. Uh, but right now we're going to look at uh, an atheist's moral challenge. And normally I would not have paid any attention to this channel or this moral challenge. Uh, I'd never heard of the channel before. Um and hadn't, hadn't heard of this challenge before, but someone out in California said, uh, could I respond to a moral challenge put out by Apologia? And I thought he was saying Apologia, um, the, which, is, okay. which is a Christian ministry. And uh, I was wondering what in the world they would be issuing a challenge about. Um, but anyway, then, then he, he sent me the link and it's from a, uh, it's from an atheist channel called Pologia or Pologia. I don't know. I don't know how he pronounces Pologia. His, he says Pologia. Pologia. Okay. So Pologia, uh, issued a, a moral challenge to Christians. And this is supposed to show that we have some problems in our moral thinking and especially, um, especially with our claims that atheists have a problem with their moral thinking. So, but before we get started, uh, I just want to say hi to everyone and IP, how you doing? Good, how you doing? Pretty good. I keep realizing every time I say IP, <laughs> I normally go by initials if someone has a channel or, or something like that, like the apostate prophet, I always call him AP, but uh, IP sounds like I'm urinating. Uh, so anyway, Mike. <laughs> That's fine. You can Mike, how you, whatever. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing good, doing good. All right. So yeah, uh, actually, uh, Paulo G and I just had a debate Sunday, kind of a debate, more of a dialogue on divine hiddenness. So yeah, I'm more familiar with the channel than you probably are. Yeah. And that's, uh, I'm glad you bring up divine hiddenness, right? Why don't you, I'm going to connect this, but why don't you just give people a general idea of what the atheist argument from divine hiddenness would be? I mean, the basic argument in a nutshell, if I can sum it up quickly, is that, that God doesn't appear to be uh, believed by all or seen by all and so he seems to remain hidden and therefore he's keeping some people from salvation and so him and i had a conversation if that was a coherent argument or not mm -hmm. all right I mean, that's that's really simplifying it though. Mm -hmm. yeah so uh all kinds of issues can go into that if we if we wanted to flesh it out we could spend a lot of time going through what the atheist argument from divine hiddenness is and this was this was one of my objections when i was an atheist i would just look if god wants us to believe in him why didn't he appear to us why didn't he do something why didn't he come down here strike start striking lightning bolts around right um why is he why is he hiding from us right but the idea is if we sit here and go through the arguments we will do our best to give an accurate representation of what the argument is and when we try to refute it we will do our best to accurately accurately state what the argument is and mm -hmm. then try to refute it the same thing with the problem of evil my, my entire doctoral dissertation was on one atheist like i believe draper's an agnostic but one uh critic of theism's um argument from evil so he's arguing that uh that the the kinds and varieties and so on of evil in the world uh, present a kind of problem for theism because <coughs> What we see in the world is uh, much more probable on the assumption that naturalism is true than it is on the assumption that, that theism is true. So he had, very, he had several versions of the argument, but I very carefully laid out his arguments and then uh, said what I thought was, was wrong with them. The reason I'm pointing this out is because for some reason, and we talked about this last week when we were talking about the moral argument, Michael, is, 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 this, is this your experience that when atheists try to state what our arguments are and what, what the, the moral argument is or, or what these various, you know, the ontological argument is, is it, your, is it your experience 
that they almost never, almost never, there are exceptions, but they almost never state accurately what our argument is? I'd say about 75% of the time, in my experience, yeah. It's like, the moral argument is about moral ontology, and a lot of times atheists tend to confuse that with moral epistemology or normative ethics and... Mm -hmm. So oh, it, so it, it it doesn't have to it doesn't have to be when I say that by the way I'm not saying that there's something uh, in that they're intentionally misrepresenting the arguments right no. I think I, it's just that they really just don't seem to understand what the arguments are they don't seem to understand what our claims are and we said this we said this last time usually usually when you bring up uh, the claim that there's no foundation or basis for uh, right and wrong in atheism as a worldview, the the immediate response, even from very very educated atheists, is what What are you saying? You're saying I can't I can't be moral? Nope, nope, <laughs> not what I'm saying. Not what I've yeah. ever thought in my life. Never occurred to me. Has nothing to do with the argument. As far as as far as the things I've done in my life, um, if you expect, I mean, if you go back to my from basically when I was five years old up until I was 20 years old, I would say the vast majority of the people who have ever existed have lived far more moral lives than uh, than I have. And so it's got nothing, nothing to do with it. Um, yeah. And, and that kind of takes us into the video because mm -hmm. I watched through this a couple times. I watched it a couple times a day. I probably watched it about six to seven times or now. And my main problem with this video is there's a lot of conflating going on between the different branches of ethics. And so I gave you some slides. Mm -hmm. I want to go through these slides first and foremost before we go through the video. Mm -hmm. Because if we go through these slides first, when we watch the video, I'm sure some people will start to see some of the issues that are going to come up. And so we need to understand what ethics is, what theists mean by the moral argument, and what is kind of going on here. So when you're ready to put up the slides, just let me know, and I can go – right through them and just explain mm -hmm. what, what's kind of going on here. Uh, just so you know, JMD Apologetics 101 says, David Wood and Michael Jones, what do these guys know? So you're being <laughs> you're being harassed. And just so everyone knows, there are new YouTube policies against harassment. And so uh, JMD That's Apologetics fine. 101 has to be banned forever <laughs> from exactly. YouTube. All right. That's fine with me. I'm perfectly fine with that. All right. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna look at the slides here and notice what's going on. Notice what's going on. Um, Michael is trying to be very careful in defining his terms and defining what we mean when we say various things, because when you do that, there's much less chance of there's much less chance of misrepresenting misrepresenting. <laughs> and we need to do that because ethics is a very hard study to explain. <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm laughing at the the atheists over here. Check out there's a level of atheist argumentation over here. D D W fears those who do not have sky wizard delusions. <laughs> That's like the same comment by the last 900 atheists who came to my channel. You, you need a sky daddy. You need a sky wizard. You need a magic magic dragon in the sky. Go I, I've gotten to the point where atheists start insulting me, and I just kind of laugh. I'm like, "Yeah, that's great, man. Whatever." <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't have a I wouldn't have a problem with it if it wasn't so completely unoriginal, right? It's like, <laughs> it's like every time I make Fair a enough. every time I make a criticism of 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 Islam, the, it's the same response. Oh, look, you're saying your sky wizard is bigger than their sky wizard, and th that's that's like all. That's all the guys. Just to be clear, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not talking about all atheists. I have a ton of atheists. Uh, I get along with. I've had multiple atheists uh, in in live streams with me. Abdullah Samir and uh, uh, Armin Navabi and and AP and, and so pa on. Paulo Gia is actually a pa uh, Paulo Gia and Shannon Q. Mm -hmm. Just was on their channel for the debate on divine is Great atheists. Nothing yeah. against them. I think. Yeah. Wonderful. His his video sounds his video sounds like he's trying to be as reasonable as possible. Yeah. Not trying to be Absolutely. not trying to get nasty or not trying to be insulting and so on. Um, so uh oh, we got Mike Winger with an exclamation point here. <laughs> oh yeah, he's here. All right, Mike. You can watch our you can watch our live stream and see how it's done, and then take some of the <laughs> skills you learn back to your own channel. All right, well we are going to get into the into the issue right now. Now keep in mind, I am a philosopher. Michael is a philosopher. Amateur. Um, yeah, we're uh, but we are going to, uh, of course, be using some philosophical terms. Uh, we will try to break down those terms as much as we can. If you do not understand some term 
Um, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Try, try to get it. But if you don't get it, we will be we will be breaking down the issues in a way that are that should be perfectly should be perfectly clear. So again, if you if you're seeing a term and you just you can't get your mind around that term, I'm saying this because I know from experience when they're when I when I study certain kinds of philosophy, I don't I can't figure out what they're saying. I, so it's like like when when I study continental philosophy, I will sit there and read it and I don't understand what they're saying. So I think there's a problem with me, and then I read it again and read it again and read it again. I still can't understand what the continental philosophers are saying. And then eventually I start thinking that they're not actually saying anything. So I start making fun of, of continental philosophy and stuff like that. But I don't know. I don't know if they're actually saying anything. I can't understand what they're saying. So no shame in, in not understanding something we're about to say, especially if this stuff is new. But um, try to follow along and we'll, we'll certainly do our best to break down. But basically, um, uh, I'm going to hand things over now to... Uh, to Michael, he's going to give you a little introduction to uh, how we're using these terms and so on. Uh, introduction to uh, to to how we're using these claims when we talk about the moral argument and so on. And then after that, we'll get into the video and we'll see what you guys think of the video. All right, you ready for your first slide here? Yeah, let's put the first slide up. So right. the problems with this video is it's it's conflating a lot of different branches in ethics. So what do we mean by ethics? Ethics is the study of what is right and wrong, good or evil. The study of moral pr principles that govern a person's behavior, uh, the conduct conducting of an activity, or what is valuable. That's a very colloquial definition. I wouldn't say it's a rigorous definition, but just get an idea of what it is. It's the study of right and wrong, good or evil. So next slide. Okay. So then there are different branches uh, of ethics. Mm -hmm. One of these branches is called metaethics. It looks at what we mean by morality. And I put a little bit more, a definition I got off um, IEP, belief that, but we don't have to go over that. That's just a more rigorous definition. Metaethics is more about what do we mean by morality? Is it objective? Is it subjective? Is it non-cognitive? Is it something that's just defined by the culture? Is it defined by the person? Is it really objective? And if it is objective, is it some sort of natural objective morality or is it non-natural objective morality? It's more about what we mean by morality. When I do my series on metaethics, you can go to the next slide. Uh, there are many different. Views oh, what, what, one second, they, uh, one second, uh, Michael. There were they. These were numbered in a certain way, but they appeared on my screen in a certain way. So, as far as number wise, you have a, a, a sort of a diagram for number three. But in terms yeah, of how diagram. you want the diagram, okay. Yeah, the diagram. Yeah, all okay. of the um, ethical branches. Yeah. All right. uh, and so these are all the different theories of metaethics. I got a, a series on my channel that covers a lot of this. Mm -hmm. So if you want more information on it, you can just kind of go there. But that's just kind of a br basic idea of what metaethics is. We don't have to get into any of these tonight for the sake of the video. So you can go to the next slide, which is uh, number four. Uh, so again, metaethics looks at what we mean by morality. Okay, what do we mean by those terms? Is it objective? Is it subjective? Is it cognitive, non cognitive? And when I do metaethics, I don't need to reference any Christian philosopher. A lot of the metaethicists that are um, believe in objective morality are actually atheists, like Thomas Nagel, Rusche Ferlando. I rely on them to know what morality actually means. Now, normative ethics is a different branch. It looks at what we ought to do to be moral. Uh, should we be? Should we try to increase the mo the well-being for the most number of people? Are there specific moral laws we cannot break, like a deontologist like it's always wrong to kill regardless if it reduces well-being or causes more well-being it's just wrong to kill. normative ethics looks at what we are supposed to be doing in the moral world and there are different theories about that so meta ethics what do we mean by morality objective subjective cognitive non-cognitive normative ethics looks at what we ought to be doing and these are different branches so you can go to the, the fifth slide now okay now moral ontology moral ontology isn't really a field in ethics, it's more in ontology, but it, it overlaps. And this looks at what morality is. What is the nature of morality? Are moral values and duties irreducible? Like they just simply are fundamental, they are? Are they emergent from some sort of natural phenomenon? Are they simply non existent, like a nihilist would say? Okay, so if they exist, where do they come from and what are they grounded in? Moral ontology is where the moral argument focuses on. It doesn't focus on meta ethics, it doesn't focus on normative ethics. The moral argument is just made from moral ontology. For example, when I argue in metaethics for objective morality, also called moral realism, that is that's different than moral ontology. Again, I can reference just atheists that are philosophers when I do metaethics. But when I get to moral ontology, I'm obviously going to rely on theistic philosophers who believe that objective morality is grounded in a deity, namely God. So notice the differences here. Final slide. 
Now, moral epistemology is a, a branch that's sort of like, again, it's not actually in ethics, it's an, in epistemology, but it covers a lot of different areas. Moral epistemology overlaps into metaethics, it overlaps into moral psychology. In fact, when you do metaethics, looks at what you mean by morality, you're doing a little bit of moral epistemology, they overlap a lot. But this looks at how we know what is moral. Okay, can we ever know that it is wrong to torture innocent children? Can we ever know anything is morally right or wrong, just or unjust? How do we know what is moral? That's what a moral epistemology is looking at. Is it intuitive? Is it something we have to discover in nature? Uh, how do we know? So these are the four basic areas I want to focus on tonight because when I watched Apologia's video, I saw a lot of jumping in between these different branches. And that to me was an issue because when we're talking about the moral argument, it's how do we ground morality? It's only moral ontology. It is not, it is not about metaethics. It's not about normative ethics, what we ought to do. Like, do we have to maximize well-being or not? I mean, it depending on, on your normative ethical view. You may disagree. To, you may think maximizing well-being has not, is the wrong theory of normative ethics. But it's only about moral ontology. So just know these basic branches moving forward. And when we get to the video, I'll start explaining where some conflation is going in when we're jumping to different things. And I want to emphasize the moral argument. When we're talking that morality is grounded in God, it's only about moral ontology. It's got nothing to do with the other th three uh, areas of study I've mentioned tonight. <clears throat> All right. So um, I'm going to take this screen down. So uh, go ahead and uh, your, your uh, um, break down one more time for us. Uh, okay. Moral, moral ontology and moral epistemology and how lots of people are... Uh, I can give an analogy. They're being, they're being analogy. confused. And, and, yeah. yeah. So again, moral ontology is what is morality? Is it something that's objective and independent of us? Is it just these psychological things we experience? Is it defined by our... Is it something like that's grounded in like a culture? Moral epistemology is how do we know what moral is? So think of science. Mm -hmm. Science is grounded in the natural world. But how we come to learn science is, of course, would be ep epistemic, epistemology. But science is ontologically grounded in the natural world. So it's not just like a social construct, like some people want to say. Likewise, in morality, in ethics, you could say that uh, there are objective moral values and duties that are beyond us. That's what they ontologically are and how we come to know about that is through intuition or maybe we uh, – you could even argue if you're a theistic evolutionist that we evolved to learn these certain things that are actually true, independent of us, just like we evolved to learn what science is or what math is. How we come to learn or understand something is not what it is in an ontological sense or what its nature actually is. So that's a very important distinction. So um – just so you guys know, ontology, that's the, that's the, when you're talking about ontology, you're talking about things like existence and the, the being of a thing. So um, that's the main question we're asking with the moral argument, right? So if, you, if you're sitting with an atheist and uh, you say, hey, uh, I, I want to know, you know, you're condemning this and you're saying God should do this and God ought to do that and Christians are bad for this and religion is bad for that. I'm interested in understanding what you mean by this claim that it's bad or that Christians are wrong for doing this or that Muslims are wrong for doing that or I'm interested in what you mean. Do you mean that you just don't like it? Um, do you mean that they're doing something that goes against uh, what your society teaches is right? Do you mean that it goes against something, your, your, your sort of hardwiring against your herd instinct? What exactly do you mean by this claim? Because here's the, here's the problem in a nutshell. I'm saying this because we know, you know, we, we know if, especially if you've never heard terms like epistemology and ontology and things like that, um, normative, things like that, uh, we know they can be difficult to grasp, even if we, you know, even if we break them down, uh, it can be difficult to, to keep them clear in your mind. So, so, so at least get the gist, at least get the gist. Um, what is the status of that moral claim that such and such is right or such and such is wrong? What is the status there? So that's when we're, when we say that, when we ask that we're asking about ontology, right? What is that thing? What is that moral claim? Right? What, uh, what is it? Yeah. yeah. And so that's what we're asking atheists because when a Muslim says, uh, stealing is forbidden. I know what the I know what the Muslim means. When a Jew says something, I know what the Jew means. When a Christian says something, I know what the Christian 
means. When various people from various backgrounds uh, say things, I understand what they mean. Even even when an atheist who is trying to be consistent with his worldview says uh, that you know morality is relative or something like that, I, I understand what he means, and then I understand what he means by his moral claims. And I would say, um, based on the video, I seem to understand um, Paula Gia's view of of. Uh, of morality as far as what it is it's sort of wired into us by evolution mm -hmm. because we're we're uh the, the evolution has produced um creatures that have to survive because you wouldn't have survived if you weren't wired like that and so we're sort of wired to seek the well-being of uh of human beings uh, and so on right so and, that, and that, I, I, oh go ahead yeah and i was gonna say and when we get to that point in the video and that's one of the confusions coming in that's confusing moral epistemology moral ontology because mm -hmm. if you're a theistic evolutionist you can say god uh, directed evolution to make mm -hmm. us learn what morality actually mm -hmm. is just because it's wired into us that doesn't mean just because what's wired into us is how we understand morality that doesn't mean that's all that morality is and that's that's a huge conflation right there and that's mm -hmm. one of the what's one of the things that bothered me in the mm -hmm. video um yeah so but but the i, I was just i was just pointing out that uh, it, I would I understand what someone is saying if they say what I mean by right and wrong as far as the the ontology of it uh, it's we were wired to behave in certain ways or something like that and and some of these things some of these ways we're wired are actually beneficial to the species and so on and 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 that's what we mean. He he did never state what his actual stance was, but I get what you're saying. I think yeah that was that was kind of that was kind of towards the end when. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he was saying, you know, the anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and look at it. Um, but uh, so we're going to go ahead and look at some video clips here. Uh, Inane Dragon says, does David not understand what it means when I say that it is wrong to reduce pleasure and increase harm? No, I understand that completely. But if you're if you're using that as your basis for morality and you're using that to make uh, various claims. Uh, and if you're stating this as some sort of claim that we all have to follow, yeah, I have no clue what you're talking about if you're an atheist, right? What do you mean? What do you mean when you say it's wrong to reduce pleasure? So if there is some uh, uh, pedophile looking at uh, child pornography over in the corner, and he's getting much pleasure out of that. And I say, I want to reduce his pleasure. I want to go stop him from doing that and make sure he goes to jail and can't do that anymore. Um, you're saying that it would be wrong of me because I'm reducing his pleasure? Do you see this? Guys, if you have a moral theory and in, in two seconds I can uh, poke all kinds of holes in it. Uh, inane Dragon, would you say that it is wrong of me to stop a pedophile from looking at pornography and don't start saying well, what if he molests kids let's suppose he's 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 locked in a room forever and looking at child pornography um would you say that it's wrong of me to stop him from looking at child pornography um i don't think i am wrong for saying that but notice that would be something that 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 you can't say you would have to say i'm wrong for doing that david you're david you're wicked and immoral for stopping that man from looking at child pornography. You're ruining his pleasure, David, you madman. I can't believe it. So notice, ladies and gentlemen, um, <laughs> that that guy's, uh, that guy's pleasure on, on this in this sense would be a good thing that we shouldn't interfere with, but me stopping him, I would be the evil one. So the pedophile, it's not, it's that's not. all good, and me stopping him, that's bad. You see how, wow. Anyway, all right, yeah. go ahead. You wanna comment on this oh, before yeah. we go on the video? Now, it just sounds like he's arguing from uh, some sort of form of uh, natural moral <laughs> realism, which is riddled with problems like G.E. Moore's open-ended question argument or the is ought problem or the inab inability to derive categorical imperatives. There's a lot of problems with natural moral realism. Yeah, there's just uh, – they, they they lay down this, ha, here's my view, and they've clearly never thought through it. They've never considered objections. They've never allowed anyone to raise an objection. That's why they say it with confidence and they can throw it forward. It's, ha, huh, does David not understand this? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. well if, if you're okay defending pedophiles, which is what you just did, then all right, here we go. All right, so we're going to go and look at this video. The video is a bit longer. He has some stuff at the beginning, but I tried to cut forward until, uh, until we're at the part where he's... Uh, just giving his argument, so I'm going to kind of probably catch him somewhere around the right right spot here. But we'll go nice. ahead. And, we'll go ahead and watch uh, a minute or so at a time, or 45 seconds to a minute or so at a time, because uh, we don't want to try and uh, get to everything uh, at once. So, Michael, I don't know if you wanted to try and uh, listen as we're going, but here I'm I, good. All right, here we go. Matt. 
first, let's define morality, simply as evaluating actions against how well they will achieve some desired goal or outcome, a method of determining that some actions are more favorable than others. I hope that works for everyone. Now, hang on. Uh, <laughs> you can hear me, right, Michael? Oh, yeah. Uh, morality, evaluation of how well an action will achieve some desired goal or outcome. Would that be, would that be uh, your definition of morality? No, and to be fair, I did talk to him Sunday about it, and he said he wasn't really nailed down to this definition. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna criticize him on this. I think, I think he realizes it wasn't a really rigorous definition. This definition itself seems to just be a specific type of normative ethics because it's talking about actions will achieve some desired good or outcome. It's it, it's kind of general and vague, but it wouldn't really encompass things like meta ethics or applied ethics. Uh, but but he, to be fair, he said, you know. It, he wasn't nailed to this. It's just try. He, it wasn't part of his main argument. Yeah, um, <laughs> guys, because I can, I can, I can see all sorts of problems with this, um, and so it's good that he's not nailed down to it, right? But as, so, as, as soon as you start incorporating in there, you know, uh, matter of fact, let me go, let me go back to it just so I make sure I don't misrepresent him here. Second, um, I frequently hear Christian. Let me go back to morality, simply as okay. Evaluation of how well an action will achieve some desired goal or outcome. So, what if your what if the desired outcome is as much power as possible, and so you try to slaughter everyone who gets in your path, and so your actions would be geared towards reaching that goal or outcome, and so anything you do, no matter how many people you're slaughtering, if your goal or outcome is as much power as possible, well, your 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 acts would be moral by that in that sense, and and that's kind of the that's kind of the difficulty I have with. Um, with talking about desired, uh, desired goals or something like that, um, you a lot. It's very common for atheists to say, you know, whatever achieves the most well-being, or whatever achieves the most happiness, or whatever achieves mm -hmm. um, uh, us maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, or something like that. Uh, and you lay these things down, and then the you know the the idea is, well, why is that? Why is that the goal at which all things? should aim. You could say, well, why not? I'd say, yeah, but it's, suppose someone comes along and says, I just do not care about how much pleasure you have. Uh, I want something else. How do you say, well, you're you're wrong and and I'm right? How, how do you make that claim? So uh, yeah, I'd have a bit of a difficulty here, but let's let it let's let it slide and and we'll he, continue. He he said he you know he was not nailed to that, so that's okay, good. To know. That's good. That's good. And 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 that's that's that probably has to do with why you said he's he's pretty cool atheist, right? If he if he's willing to say you know uh, okay, well I'm not I have to, yeah. might have to rethink that. So okay, that's good. All right, so let's go here. Evaluating actions against how well they will achieve some desired goal or outcome, a method of determining that some actions are more favorable than others. I hope that works for everyone. Second, I frequently hear Christian apologists assert that moral evaluations would be impossible in a universe where God did not exist. As Frank Turk explains, I mean, if all that exists are materials, how do you explain goodness, righteousness, and justice? You can't. They're not made of materials. So atheists can know goodness, can righteousness, and justice. They just yep. have no ex. What's up? Where, where are you at right now in the video? Uh, he's, playing, uh, he's playing some what? audio from Frank Turek. And, okay, uh, finish I, that. And then I'm at. I'm at. I give you exact. I'm at one minute and fifty eight seconds in his video. And okay, so finish that and then stop. All right, I'll back up a little bit just so everyone can uh, can follow can follow here. That moral evaluations would be impossible in a universe where God did not exist, as Frank Turk explains. I mean, if all that exists are materials, how do you explain goodness, righteousness, and justice? You can't. They're not made of materials. So atheists can know. Goodness, righteousness, and justice, they just have no explanation for why those things exist. Third, the Bible... And the All right, so, audience. yeah, yeah, so the, uh, we did the first two points, so it finished right around two minutes, right after he played the uh, the Turek um, audio. So Turek was basically saying, if everything is just material, then how do you explain um, how do you explain moral truths because they're not material, they're, they're immaterial? Well, here, here's the thing I will say, I don't think... Frank Turk, I, I don't think Frank Turk said anything wrong. I don't, I don't really agree with how he was articulating things. But before that, Apologia said something about moral. Christians often say moral evaluations would be impossible in a world that. Uh, is that what he said? Is that what he said? Because that would be false. That would be false. Yeah. Now, I, I'm not. I'm not saying some Christians have never said that. That might very well be true. Because as I was trying to say earlier, when you get into ethics, I don't think the English language is is equipped to really handle ethics. 
I think mm-hmm. sometimes it's not doesn't have the right terminology. Mm-hmm. But I it, it that's, it's just wrong. I don't think we should ever say that moral evaluations would be impossible in a world where God doesn't exist because you could have subjective moral evaluations. You could have non cognitive moral evaluations. You could have a, a theory of normative ethics that is somehow based upon one of those other metaethical views. So I don't think we would ever say, and we're, you and I would not say, that moral motivations would be impossible without God, because the subject could always do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and Turek, Turek wouldn't say that either. He would. He would. He didn't say that in that clip. Yeah, no, he didn't definitely say that. Yeah, I mean the 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 position of guys like Turek is you, you do moral evaluations all the time, but it's because you're it's because you're you're stealing. I think he calls it stealing. You're stealing from God, right? You're using something you got from someone else. You're borrowing yeah. stuff from other worldviews that make absolutely no sense on your worldview and you just don't realize it. Um, and Frank and Frank Turek is talking about moral ontology there. How do we ground morality? What is it? What is the nature of it? When you're talking about moral evaluations, mm-hmm. I had to actually ask Paul G. what he meant by that, and he said, deciding where to place an action or potential action on one's personal good or bad spectrum by whatever mechanism or criteria that person uses to make such determinations. Okay, so by that logic, he sounds like he's talking about how you make moral evaluations and normative ethics, what you ought to do. Mm-hmm. But Frank Turek is not in normative ethics here. He's talking about moral ontology. Yes. What which, is which is clear? It's, which is clear when he starts saying, "Hey, if matter is all that you have to work with." Uh, and you could expand that a little bit. You could, you know, uh, matter, energy, things like that. If all you have are, are physical things, um, what do you do with, you know, how are you explaining moral truths which which aren't physical? Where, where where are you grounding them? So he's clearly talking about he's clearly talking about um, ontology, not not our mere not whether we can make evaluations or something like that. Yeah, it's like it, this is what I mean about the video. There's a lot of conflating going on. Tarek's talking yeah. about moral ontology when you're talking about moral evaluations. On Polygia's definitions, he's in normative ethics. All right, so we'll go ahead and continue. Uh, Shannon Q here, go, going back to, um, so she apparently watched the video uh, when I said that I think I gathered his, I've never, that, that's the only uh, Polygia video I've seen, but um, yeah. I, I like his videos. I don't agree with everything he says, but I think he's nice to listen no, to. No, no, she, she's responding to, I thought I could gather what his what his view of of basically moral ontology was by him saying that, you know, we evolved in a certain way. Um, yeah. But Shannon is saying true. he didn't state his stance. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to see. We'll have to see whether he was just putting this forward as a hypothetical or whether it's a, it's his he, actual position. He, Sounded like it was his position to me. Uh, he, he kind of is making it as a challenge. I don't think it's his actual position. I think I've gathered he's more of a sub... He's not a more. I don't think he's a moral realist, but I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. He's. I think he's a moral non-realist. Yeah. Um, all right, so we ready to continue? What time? What uh, what uh, time mark? Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna back it up right till about uh, the end of the turret clip. So I'm gonna start right about two minutes. All right, go ahead, and we'll go ahead and watch his next point here. Explanation for why those things exist. Third, the Bible indicates that God's moral laws are written on the hearts of every person. There are some basic principles of right and wrong that everyone knows, whether they will admit them or not. This innate moral code is what drives even non-believers to sometimes act morally moment to moment and feel guilty when they do not. Now, we're going to assume for the moment that all of this is true, even granting some sort of objective nature to it, which isn't really part of today's question. I'm going to call this Bible morality, for lack of a better name, and represent it here with a yellow circle. Even assuming that this yellow circle is the best and objectively right moral system, you must acknowledge that many people make their moral choices based on some other system, as flawed as that may be. They may use a moral framework described by some other religion, or maybe some cultural ideology, or maybe they're a psychopath whose moral evaluations exclude everyone but themselves. Hey, first of all, why does everyone have to diss psychopaths? Huh? (laughs) Huh? If you're if you're a if you're a Apologia fan who came over here for the first time, <laughs> Dave is a psychopath. I was diagnosed as a psychopath when I was uh, 18 years old. Um, diagnosed? That's official. Yeah, that's official. I could slap so, my paperwork up on the screen. They said I'm. Know. They said I'm in. You know what's funny was they gave me the so they they gave me this uh, they gave me this uh, report and stuff and it says uh, uh, people like David Wood are incapable of remorse. 
And I, I, I so disliked being told what I can and can't do that I was like, what? How do you, how can you tell me I'm incapable of remorse? And then I was like, uh, and then I stopped and thought, like, have I ever felt remorse in my life? And no, I have no, I didn't even know, what, I don't even know what you guys mean when you're talking about that. So uh, anyway. Uh, so I'm actually, well, before you go, I'm kind of glad you stopped it here mm -hmm. because I, I, I know he's trying to use these for lack of a better term, but I, I would say there really is no such thing as bible morality the bible has moral claims in it but we don't say that morality necessarily keyword necessarily has to come from the bible the bible clarifies repeats you know claims or gives moral claims but morality especially in where we say it comes from in meta ethics if you're a moral realist like christians typically are it comes from intuition in romans chapter 2 god has written the law in our hearts you don't necessarily need the Bible to know what is moral. Uh, so, I mean, this is and, that, and that's kind of and that's and that's even according to the Bible, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So, I don't like using the term Bible morality. I know he's using it for lack of a better term, as he said, but it's sort of setting up almost a straw man, which he's going to come back to later, because there really is no, there really isn't Bible morality. The Bible is it includes morality, but it encompasses more. It's not like we have to say we have to get our morality. From the Bible, we can say that the Bible, you know, teaches things that we know that to be moral. It confirms things we know to be moral. It may shed some more light on better ways to understand morality, but I don't know. It just doesn't. It, it, it puts a bad feeling, or it gives me a bad like thing. Like that's just not the right term for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would use the better term more like maybe a certain type of normative ethics, like or you know, like virtue ethics. He could have said maybe deontology. I don't know. I just didn't really like the term. Yeah, I'm a little uh. I'm a little confused here too. I mean, I guess if you're if you're thinking of sort of Bible morality as like the the sum total of all the you know the Bible's moral claims, um, so you have that. You have all of the commands about right and wrong, all the Bible statements about um, what's right and what's wrong. Um, but then you would sort of have this. Uh, you'd have sort of a let's say a biblical view of uh, moral epistemology, a, of a biblical view of moral ontology and so on. So you have, you know, basically the, the, the claims that the Bible makes about what's right and what's wrong, then, you know, how we know these things. And so, you know, God gives us a, a conscience that we, you know, something like that. And then you have, of course, what is it that, that grounds all of these things? But, it, it, and we're, we're going to see this as we go on, but uh, yeah, I, I think he's, Think he's going to confuse these when you notice if you come up with like a generic term like bible morality and we would mm -hmm. in order to be clear we'd have to say tell us exactly what you mean by bible morality so that later when you're talking about it you don't mm -hmm. import some other interpretation some other understanding or, or meaning of what you're saying there um and this is not entirely his fault again I, as i said ethics i don't think the english language is equipped to handle ethics it just isn't it is, it is, it is difficult, right? Because no, notice, notice, if, if you're talking to an atheist and you're talking to a Christian, you say, hey, you know, the mor Bible morality and stuff, you, you guys would have a you know general idea of what, what you're talking about there, right? You know, what, what the Bible's saying and stuff. When you're laying out an argument that is supposed to be a, a problem for Christians, or if it's supposed to be a response to a Christian argument, once you're making arguments and refutations of arguments and counter arguments and things, that's all of a sudden when you need to be pretty clear in what you're saying. So uh, what he's pointing out here, if he, it, it, in Bible morality, apparently he's saying that that there are things in the Bible that other people, and this is the the slide here, uh, that people from other religions and other cultural ideologies are going to agree with. Um, yeah. And so that's the Maybe. that's the overlapping area, and then the areas that aren't overlapping, like the yellow part that's not uh, that's not orange or or pinkened. Uh, those are claims that the Bible makes about right and wrong that don't overlap with certain cultural ideologies. So uh, the claim that yeah. you know you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? That, that is that is foundational um, in the Bible. You're supposed to do that. But Shannon, oh, go ahead. Shannon Q just said he he means literally any Christian moral framework. Again, I still don't know what that means. Because my moral framework in terms of normative ethics is virtue ethics. Yeah, and yeah. I don't need to invoke Christianity to explain my normative ethics. My virtue eth I hold to virtue ethics. I, I there are other Christians who are deontologists. They yeah. hold to more of a Kantian version. 
So yeah, again, I, I don't think yeah, really and there are there are divine command theorists, and so you have all kinds. Mm -hmm. You have all sorts of. Yeah, you have all you have all kinds. I would be a sort of combination. I would combine elements of of multiple views, but yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> So it's okay. It's yeah. not really the challenge. Yeah, we we're, can move on. We're trying to understand exactly what someone means. So, so just to recap, what's going on right here? Um, you have apparently he means Bible morality is basically everything that the Bible says about morality, and some of that is going to overlap with what other people believe. Some of it isn't, and then the psychopath is way out there. When I don't know, you could the psychopath might touch these other ones, and that the psychopath wants to destroy you if you do ah. something if you do something wrong to him. So you could say, well, as long as you know. agree, you could say, is hey, if, if I you and I agree that it's wrong to harm me, so we got that we got that Maybe. point in agreement. I don't know. We can move on now. All right, here we go, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. So I'm starting. Uh, I'm starting at three, go and then we're going to go forward. All right. All in world, you'd expect to fall on evaluations. Some philosophers who think about such things claim that when it comes down to it, humans generally evaluate actions in light of reducing harm and increasing well-being. And because we are a social species, that the further we extend these considerations beyond ourselves, to family, to tribe, to nation, to species, and so on, and extend them from short-term to long-term time periods, the more success we have in surviving. For the sake of discussion, imagine that this blue circle represents a moral system that wants to maximize well-being over the longest term and over the greatest scope of beings. And so we'll evaluate actions purely according to this criteria. Well, uh, I'm stopping at, uh, at 345 because I just had a huge problem with something you said there. Yeah, me too. Um, I had two problems, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'll state my problem, then you can point yours out. Me, I was, it was, I was, I was, <laughs> it was how he, let's see if I can uh, find the point where he says it again, so I make sure I state it accurately. Periods, the more success we have in surviving. For the sake of discussion, imagine that this blue circle represents a moral system that wants to maximize well-being over the longest term and over the greatest scope of beings. And so... Oh, yeah. It was him saying that the blue represents um, maximizing well-being uh, for whatever he said and the greatest number of beings. The reason I have a problem with that, ladies and gentlemen, is if you say over the greatest number of beings, then you should annihilate humanity. Right. <laughs> if that's what you mean, if you mean greatest number of beings, notice you're not just talking about human beings here. Right. You're talking about uh, dogs, cats. Uh, you're talking about ants, you're talking about all kinds of insects, worms, you're talking about trees. Um, even if you, even if we wanted to, to specify sentient, sentient life, and not just, you know, trees and things like that. Even if we said sentient life, you know, things with things that, you know, feelings and senses and so on. Um, human beings are massively destructive to lots of species in areas where where we move into them right so if you're trying to maximize the well-being uh, of the greatest number of beings then you just got to get rid of humans because most other beings are going to be much better off without us messing around with them right you know let, me, you know let me let me let me say the two issues i have with this mm -hmm. is that uh, maximize well-being that's so be a normative claim this is what we ought to do but what if i'm a deontologist the deontologists say there's certain moral commands we ought to follow regardless if it maximizes well-being or not so it's wrong to kill regardless if i could kill than on deontology if i could kill thanos and prevent him from killing you know half of all life i shouldn't because that's morally wrong even though it would maximize well-being oh hang on what, 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 just 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 pause right there to under, uh, so people can understand uh deontological ethics there uh the the, mm -hmm. fa the famous example from kant who's sort of sort of the granddaddy of, of this view was if someone comes to your house uh yeah. if someone comes to your house you someone's borrowed a knife or something like that someone comes to your house and says uh, i need my knife because i'm about to go hack a bunch of people to death um you, you you know notice a lot of people would say oh no you know i lost that knife uh yeah sorry uh come back some other time when you're not crazy and about to go on a killing spree uh these these are the kinds of examples that are used uh based on yeah, stuff that so, kant said uh, but notice according to kant you should not lie even in that situation so notice people that the real life example that you could give here is uh people during the holocaust who were hiding 
uh, Jews and other people in their basements and attics to or under their floorboards to keep Nazis from coming killing them. The Nazi shows up at the door, knock, knock. Uh, you got any Jews hiding here? Um, Kant would say you should not lie. You should, oh, uh, you know, I was trying to protect him, but I cannot tell a lie. And so it's a it's a situation where, you know, what, the the uh, the 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 well being the well being it doesn't matter. It's uh it's it's all that matters is the moral law yeah. there that you have to follow. Now this gets more to his moral challenge because he's going to bring this back later and blend these circles. Mm -hmm. But here's another qu my other issue with it. What does it mean to maximize well being? That just seems like a vague term. As a Christian, you and I would say to maximize well-being means to be a, have obedient faith in Christ and journey towards unity with God. That is ultimately going to be our best well-being. Now, the atheist is going to disagree on our well-being, so this is an oddly vaguely defined – this is a vaguely defined term. Now, he's going to say whatever you mean by maximize well-being. I get that's what he's trying to get at because when he gets to the actual challenge ahead, that will come up. But – you know, it, it's another thing that's kind of oddly, vaguely defined. And I'm a, I'm a virtue ethicist. Mm. I don't think our aim should be to maximize well, well-being mm. in terms of ethics. I think our ultimate goal as humanity should be. But I, I think in terms of virtue ethics, our, our goal should be to obtain certain virtues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I, I also am – I'm always confused with the maximizing well-being uh, because notice as soon as you start saying what it is to maximize well-being, guess what? Uh, Hitler was trying to maximize well-being. Right. He believed that in order to maximize well-being, that uh, the the great Europeans, he thought they were superior to to other groups. And so they should dominate and so on. And and he believed that this was good for the world and that he believed that it was good for the world to exterminate Jews. And that in the long run, in the long run, these things had to be done to maximize the well-being of humanity. Um, does that mean that any of that was was moral? I would I would certainly say no. But these are the sorts of problems you're going to get into when you say maximize well-being. Guess what? If I think, oh, you know, the, the, the you know, my well-being is, is determined by how much power I have or something like that, then mm -hmm. you, get the, you, get, you get the same sort of problems here. Yeah. Well, maybe we should move on to the actual challenge. Yeah. I wanted to address one, one, one comment here because uh, I wanted to point out uh, that when we are, t when we're, when we're explaining moral views, it doesn't mean that we hold those moral views. So if we're saying, uh, when, when IP is talking <laughs> about a, a deontological position, um, saying that, you know, it's always wrong to kill or something like that, uh, that's not, he, that's not his position. He's explaining the nope. position and saying that different people have different positions. So, uh, Hadith Salam said here, if a Muslim captures you and tortures your family, uh, you would not kill them. IP would not kill in self-defense. Um, well, I'm not a deontologist. I definitely would. Well, I'm a virtue ethicist. And in my view, the, the way to obtain virtue is to actually defend your family and go after them. Yeah. So that would that would. So what 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 he's saying there is he has a moral obligation to protect his family. And so he would do that. So I, I would say I would I would I would try not to kill. But there are certain situations if like I mean, if a terrorist is I'll give you another example. If a terrorist is running in, he's got his finger on the detonators about to blow everyone up and you can tackle him before he detonates it uh or if you're a cop and you shoot him i don't think you've done anything wrong i think you've done something right you have to do that sort of thing uh with that said if you could stop him in a way that doesn't kill him i think i think you should try you know you should take that route but no we, neither one of us would hold that you you should never kill a person or something like that there are, there are situations yeah. where you have to do that to protect other people all right, so let's go on. Let's go on here. I'll go ahead and back it up a little bit, just so we're not stuck in uh, the mid sentence of what he was saying right there. All yeah, right, so the I'm starting at let's say 326. We've gone a little farther than that, but going back to 326. Yeah, so we'll get to his uh, get to his uh, time periods. The more success we have in surviving. For the sake of discussion, imagine that this blue circle represents a moral system that wants to maximize well-being over the longest term and over the greatest scope of beings, and so we'll evaluate actions purely according to this criteria. We know that the real world is messy, and we could ask a lot of interesting questions, and perhaps this is vastly inferior to the yellow, but all we need for now is that blue is a theoretically possible evaluation system that evaluates actions against maximizing well-being. It should be clear that when evaluating potential actions, some actions will be moral in the blue system, others will be moral in the yellow system, and some actions will be evaluated as moral by both systems, and that agreeing overlapping area we will represent by green. No 
All right, um, I'm pausing at, at 4.18, which is just when he finished yeah. his uh, uh, showing the green area. He hasn't really explained much. Just I want to make sure everyone understands it because we do want everyone to understand his argument, right? We want... Uh, we hope that atheists understand Christian arguments, and we hope that Christians understand uh, atheist arguments. But so Bible morality, as he seems to be using it, is just you know whatever the Bible says about about right and wrong. And if you came up with everything you could say is about right and wrong solely from the perspective of a moral view that just says, hey, you know whatever maximizes the well-being of the most number of beings, again, well, we probably need to scratch that because then you just end up with nonsense. You'd end up having to kill all human beings to protect other species. But assuming he really means uh, human beings, maximizing human well-being, um, then you if, you, if you wrote a list out, if you wrote a list of all the things you should do that would maximize human well-being, you'd have uh, that, that sort of a collection of rules. And he's pointing out that... Um, there's some overlap there. So there are things that the Bible says, like, you know, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you or something like that. So don't be, uh, don't be a hypocrite. Uh, so he could say that, well, that's that I would say the exact same thing on my, in, in my project of maximizing well-being. So there's some overlap and the overlap there is going to be the green area. The blue area and the yellow area would be areas where uh, that system makes a claim that the other system wouldn't would, would reject. So if the Bible says that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, but maximizing well-being, let's say from an atheist perspective or something like that, would not include that, then that would just be in the in the yellow section, but not in the shared section. Anything you want to add? No, I would just simply say what he's going to get to after the challenge, which is. Uh, he thinks mass, maximizing will be might be a subset of Bible morality. I would simply say they are equal, in my view, is that Bible morality is equal to maximizing well-being in terms of oh, even extending beyond morality. Mm -hmm. But that's all I would say. Mm -hmm. So, in, in so in other words, if I'm understanding you correctly, there, if you have a Christian, if you're looking at this uh, chart from a Christian perspective, and you're saying, well, if 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 God told us to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, and so on, and on down the list, that all of this is going to be, all of this is, it, it's maximizing our well-being to to do this, and therefore, yeah. they're going to be the same thing. Yeah. All right, so I'm starting at 418. Yep, go ahead. 418 in the video, and let's see what you're, where he's going with this. But the diagram isn't attempting to depict any kind of relative scale, only represent the existence of these regions. And now we can get to the challenge expressed in my tweet. Challenge to Christians. What is an example of something in the yellow portion that you think most non-believers would agree with instinctively? Presumably because it is both objectively true and written on our hearts. In other words, oh. consider actions that the Bible condemns or condones that isn't already condemned or condoned by a system attempting to maximize well-being. If God has indeed written his law on the hearts of everyone, then we would expect that at least a significant portion of the population would accept such proclamation as intuitively correct, even if only deep down below their suppression of said truth. And so, my Christian friends, do you have any examples of actions that fit in the yellow portion while simultaneously affirmed by the conscience of non-believers? If so All right, so we got to, uh, I stopped at 5.15 there. Mm-hmm. Well, you see, uh, yeah. you see some difficulties mm -hmm. with what he's saying. Or so, j just just so everyone knows, uh, he <laughs> what he's saying here. He, he this is his challenge to Christians. So the yellow portion there, the yellow portion is going to be things that the Bible says uh, are right and wrong, um, and that therefore are supposed to be written on people's hearts, but would not be part of the green area. In other words, you would not conclude, you would not believe those things. Um, from the perspective of just maximizing well-being. So he said, you know, again, if, if, if something like do unto others as you would have them do unto you, he could say, yeah, 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 but we would believe the same thing. And so it would be in the green area. I'm saying, what do you have in the yellow area that is written on people's hearts or in, in their conscience, but would not be part of, of maximizing well-being? Nothing. That's my argument. Nothing. There are being the same thing. I don't. I don't understand. I don't think the challenge. I think the challenge is a non-starter. It doesn't really. 
get at what we mean by our normative claims, what we mean uh, – it, it, I don't know. I would just say nothing. I would just agree with him. There mm. is nothing. Uh, but, but what we – when as a Christian, I would say to be a Christian is to maximize well-being. So mm-hmm. nothing. Yeah, I would uh... – I would uh, I would explain things a little differently. Um, I'm thinking I'm actually thinking in terms of medieval philosophers distinguish between uh, truths of reason and truths of faith, and uh, they're not using faith they're not using faith in the way that that atheists use it today. Um, the truths of reason were things that you could figure out on your own apart from revelation, and the truths of faith were things that were those would those would be revealed to you. Now they they can be repeated, right? Um, so they, you know, the existence of God would be both the truth of reason and a, and a truth of, of faith. Um, but I would, I would view, I would view moral claims in, in sort of the same way. There, there are things that you can just know by nature, and there are things that would be revealed to you. And something can be both, right? You could sit around and figure out, you know, I, I shouldn't be a hypocrite. I should, uh, I should, uh, I should do unto others as, as, as as I would have them do to me and stuff like you can figure it out, but you can also be told that you can be told that by Jesus. So uh, I'm thinking of it in terms of that. Now, what what he's, what he's basically saying is um, what he actually, what he, what he actually believes is sort of written on our conscience as far as, as far as how we act. He's just going to say that, that we're wired, we're wired to do that. Right. Uh, It's, it's, it's starting up a change. Like we, we don't really need God. And again, as I've said, no one makes the claim that we need God to understand normative ethics, to understand what it is, to understand meta ethics. The ar- moral argument is just about moral ontology, what morality actually is. We all agree. And again, when I do meta ethics, I rely on a lot of atheistic philosophers, uh, a lot of philosophers that are atheists and also meta meta ethicists that are moral realists. And again, I agree completely. We don't need God to understand what morality is. The moral argument is not about understanding morality. It's about what it actually is. How do we ground it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, so everyone, not- notice what he's doing here. Notice what. Notice what's going on here. Um, there are certain features that that human beings in you know in in general would hold to be right and wrong. You know, don't don't torture old ladies for fun. That would be bad according to the Bible. That would be bad according to most people. Um, so let's say it's it's in that it's in that green area. It's in that green area. Uh, so we we have some sort of common moral moral belief. We have we believe that it's wrong to torture old ladies for fun. Um, what we're what we're trying to get at in in the moral argument is what is what is the status of that? Is it just something you've been raised to believe in your society? And if you notice, you could be you could raise a kid from the time he's born. To believe that the greatest thing he can do in the world is is torturing old ladies for fun, right? There, there are there are people, um, there are people in Pakistan who believe that if your sister does, you know, walks down the street without a male escort, you you have a moral obligation to to beat her to death, right? And and they believe okay. that that's right. They they really strongly believe that. Um, so the question is, what is the status of our beliefs? Are, are, are all our moral claims simply this is what our society uh, taught us, or are these things wired into us? Because it, when we're asking the question, and we're, guys, I'm, I'm perfectly serious when I, when I say, I really want to know what you say. I, want to, I really want to know how you understand these claims. Because if you're just describing in terms of hardwiring, I don't see why that's good to just follow your hardwiring, right? If, uh, if uh, some people, some people just with their wiring in their brain, they want to be, they want to molest children. Some people want to rape just based on the way they're wired, right? Some people are more violent just based on the way they're wired. What does this have to do with those things being right, following the way you're wired or, or following your instincts or something like that? So if you're going down that road, I don't see that that's a good idea. If you're saying that, you know, it's whatever your society says is right, then again, other societies have said have completely different uh, ways of looking at things like your sister walking down the street. And so if it's just whatever your society says, well, you're going to have, you've got a problem if you're not going to say so, this society versus that society. So go ahead. There's a, there's a comment in chat. So per IP, there's no argument for God for morality. Oh my goodness. <sighs> no. Again, <laughs> go back to the original slides okay. in the beginning. The, <laughs> we're arguing about when we argue for God's existence, it's about moral ontology. Mm-hmm. 
not meta ethics, not normative ethics. We don't argue from for God's existence from normative ethics or meta ethics. We argue for God's existence from mor- moral ontology. The person clearly doesn't understand the slides I went over the beginning of the different branches I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, this no, notice. I mean, we started this whole thing off by pointing out that atheists, and again, not all atheists. Uh, a lot of the people watch my channel are atheists. Some of my, some of the, you know, some of the biggest fans uh, who watch my channel are, are atheists. Again, I do live streams with atheists. I get along with lots of atheists. The atheists who are sort of aggressive and going out and refuting, they just seem to overwhelmingly completely misrepresent what the arguments are. And we started off by pointing out that atheists have a problem accurately representing arguments. We gave an example by, by, by showing that when we talk <laughs> about atheist arguments, we try to represent them accurately. Then we play this video, which which is a massive misunderstanding of the moral argument and what's at stake in the moral argument. And then he hasn't gotten to that yet. He yeah. hasn't gotten to that yet. I agree. But yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but in this video, and then in the comments <laughs> are people who are misrepresenting what, what IP is. It's guys, if the atheists who deal with these arguments are across the board, people who can't understand the simplest claims, do you think that might say something about your position or or about those who would adhere to it? In other words, if you if people are responding to the moral argument and across the board, the people who are trying to refute the moral argument are can't understand the argument and can't understand simple claims, do you think that might be kind of part of why they're rejecting the moral argument is they, they just don't understand it and anything that any of us says, they just misunderstand it? I don't know. But I'm, I'm, noting, no, no. I'm seeing a correlation here, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Do we want to do we want to keep going here? Yep. Let's go. I want to get to what he gets to. He talks about biology and everything. All right. Here we go. I'm starting at uh, 5:15. Oh, go please ahead. leave your thoughts in the comments of this video, oh, or wait. find the link to the original tweet in the description of this video. I'm pausing going. it right there at 5:21. He's uh, telling people if they have an example of something. Again, guys, think about what he's doing here, right? So a lot of what's in the Bible, a lot of what's in the Bible are things that other people you, you know other people would agree with but he's going to say that those other things that people would agree with like athe- the, the things that atheists would agree with are i think this is what he gets to in the end are just kind of the way we're wired because our species is geared towards maximizing human well-being and so those are going to be part of our wiring so he's saying find something in in bible morality that non-christians that everyone pretty much besides besides Christians would also agree to that has nothing to do with maximizing our well-being. Yeah, and, that's, and we'll get to this at the end because he brings God back into it yeah. at the end. All right, so uh, he yeah, he's saying where people can post it and stuff. We'll just go ahead and watch it until he starts getting to uh, his points again. Station going there on Twitter. Ahead. I greatly look forward to hearing your insights. Unfortunately, no criteria meeting examples have been offered so far on Twitter. General ideas like love and kindness would be affirmed by a criteria maximizing well-being, so would therefore be part of the green portion. Ideas like aversion to taking the Lord's name in vain would be yellow, but would not typically twinge the conscience of a non-believer, particularly if they were raised outside of a Christian culture. Some suggested, potentially reasonably, that there would be no blue section, that green would wholly be a subset of yellow that the Bible encompasses all things that improve well-being. I suspect that this is not the case, but I could grab that here and it wouldn't change the challenge. It would still be, what is an example of something in the yellow portion? The blue part wasn't actually part of the question. And why do I even ask the question? Well, if we don't have a good list of things in the yellow that are simultaneously affirmed by the intuitions of significant portions of non-believers, then it would seem that the green portion is what is meant when apologists appeal to objective morality, not the yellow circle. However, it would also show that everything within this objective morality can be arrived at merely with the principle of minimizing pain and maximizing well-being. At the same- um, I'm, I'm pausing it at 643. Uh, yeah, good there, point. There's, I was going to say that. There's a misunderstanding in almost everything he says. In almost everything yeah. he says. Like, even what he says about objective morality. He says, uh, uh, he apparently, when he says objective morality, he says, apparently Christian, what Christian apologists mean by objective morality is, is what's in the green there. No. 
No, ab- <laughs> no, never, not once, ever, right? Uh, no, it's, they, that's they, normative ethics. Yeah, I've, it's not meta-ethics. I've been in debates with atheists before where they seem to think that what, what we mean by objective morality is things that everyone agrees on, um, or things that, that most people agree on. Uh, guys, the, the idea of objective objective morality or an objective moral standard or objective moral duties or something like that is it wouldn't matter if every last person on the entire planet rejected it. It would still be objectively true. It would be a, an objective moral truth. Uh, in other words, if every person on the planet tomorrow decided that it's a good thing to torture old ladies for fun, if it's objectively morally wrong to torture old ladies for fun, it wouldn't matter what everyone believed. It matters what what is morally true. So so mm-hmm. so he says apparently they think that um, that the stuff in the yellow is not uh, objectively moral because they can't you know where it's it's not in it's not in the green area of of maximizing well being or something like that. Um, no no we anything that's ob, that's objectively moral is objectively moral whether whether other people agree to it or not whether other ethical systems uh, said that it's it's good or not is irrelevant so i'm just pointing that out because again every single step of the argument seems to be not understanding the language he the language he's using or our position it has nothing to do with moral ontology anyway so it has nothing to do with your moral argument Mm -hmm. yeah all right so should we continue or did you have anything else you wanted to add there no let's go all right all right here we go not too much longer i have about two minutes left uh of this of this video but let's see where it's going. A desire to avoid pain and to seek thriving are entirely survival traits. They are fully grounded in biology. Oh, you might want to argue. That- oh, this is uh, yeah, this is why why I was thinking that he was actually putting his position forward. These things are are grounded in biology, the basic uh, uh things. But let me go and replay that. Replay that part. I'm going back to uh, six twenty six. We'll play that just so we get that that section uninterrupted. That the uninterrupted. green portion is what is meant when apologists cool. appeal to objective morality, not the yellow circle. However, it would also show that everything within this objective morality can be arrived at merely with the principle of minimizing pain and maximizing well-being. At the same time, a desire to avoid pain and to seek thriving are entirely survival traits. They are fully grounded in biology. You might want to argue that creatures are not inherently obligated to seek survival, and that is true, but any group of creatures that does not seek survival will go extinct. Non-survival genes don't get passed around as often as survival genes. We creatures... Uh, yeah, I wanted to pause there. So he's talking about the genes. This is why I thought we were actually on to... Uh, now I don't know if he uh, officially adheres to this, but this is why I thought we were on to his actual um, moral position... Uh, on I, I actually don't... his uh, I, was, I was thinking that we were on to his moral ontology because he said I mean he specifically said uh, you, you could say you know people don't have a a moral obligation to seek survival and his point was well if you don't have that if you if you're not wired to seek survival you're not going to survive so notice that would that would not be if he's saying it's not a moral obligation to seek survival, and I'm guessing your own survival or the survival of others, then, wow, then uh, if, if, if that's if that's actually his, his position, I might want to listen to that again and let it continue, but. Yeah, maybe go back a little bit and listen to it again, because I have a lot, lot here, because it, it's, to me, it's what I was mentioning at the beginning, yeah, just it. because. So we're wired to believe something that doesn't mean what morality actually is. Yeah, guys. So if you don't understand what what we're saying, um, uh, we're 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 basically not sure if he if he's laying out his moral view here. Um, if he is, then what he was just saying was, uh, you know, you could say, hey, you don't have a moral obligation to seek survival, either your own survival or other people's survival. But species that do seek survival. Are, are just going to outlast other species. Other species are going to die off if they don't seek their own survival. Uh, and so it, there, notice, there's no, it's not because there's any sort of uh, objective moral obligation. It's just you're just wired to do this. So that's what I'm saying. If, if he's back to you're wired to do this because your species has survived and something that helped your species survive was that it seeks survival, then 
that is very interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and back it up just so we make sure we're not misrepresenting him because we try not to do that. I'm backing up to, let's say, uh, about 649 here. All right. And we'll go ahead and play it from there. Early survival traits. They are fully grounded in biology. You might want to argue that creatures are not inherently obligated to seek survival, and that is true. But oh. any group of creatures. <laughs> he just said it's true. <laughs> he said you might argue that you have you don't have any uh, uh, moral obligation to seek survival, and that's true. So I think we might. Let me back that up again. I, I'm trying to understand what he's saying, but but trying not to misrepresent uh, what he's saying here. Uh, I'm going to back it up slightly further. And, you know, for those of you who are, aren't entirely interested in this topic, uh, bear with us here. Want to listen to this. We just don't want to mis misrepresent what's being said here. So I'm backing up to 636, and I'm just going to let him talk here. Objective morality can be arrived at merely with the principle of minimizing pain and maximizing well-being. At the same time, a desire to avoid pain and to seek thriving are entirely survival traits. They are fully grounded in biology. You might want to argue that creatures are not inherently obligated to seek survival, and that is true, but any group of creatures that does not seek survival will go extinct. Non-survival genes don't get passed around as often as survival genes. We creatures alive today are descendants of creatures that wanted to survive. Since by definition, everything in the green is sufficiently explained by pursuit of well-being, the desire for which is sufficiently explained by biological survival advantage, and if what Christians call objective morality is contained entirely in the green portion, then God is not necessary to explain it. You may be All right, I'm going to pause it right there at uh, 734. Um, he finished. Yeah, I'm there too. Yeah, it's... Um... He he, he, God is he, not necessary he wants to he wants it. he once again said that what what Christians mean by objective morality is what's what's in the green. No, <laughs> not what, and not okay. He God. said God is not necessary to explain it. Uh, he's talking in this whole thing about normative ethics. You know, like we have to maximize well being or we have to survive whatever the normative claim is. There, mm -hmm. yeah, God is not necessary. No one argues from normative ethics to God's existence. It's about moral ontology. Mm -hmm. So when he presented this moral challenge, he was trying to get to this point that God is not necessary to explain mm -hmm. it. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, but again, the moral argument is in moral ontology, not normative ethics. So the challenge is a non-starter to really make the Christian think about if God is necessary, because God still is necessary in terms of moral ontology, mm -hmm. not normative ethics. I mean, that was never the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let me let me go ahead and say uh, l let me let me be charitable and say where where I would agree, right? If he's saying that our species is wired, is wired to seek their own well-being. And so you're, you're, you know, you're wired to seek your well-being. And, you know, part of seeking your well-being is that you're wired to seek your, your family's well-being. And uh, we just have kind of a herd instinct that makes us want to help others. <coughs> if, if, if that's what you mean when you say that um, stealing is wrong or killing is wrong is that it somehow conflicts with um, our herd instinct to sort of seek the general well-being or something like that. I would say no. As far as arguments are concerned, God would not be necessary for that. I would think God would be necessary for a lot of other things that go into uh, your position, such as even having a universe or having a universe, I mean, having a world with, with ki those kinds of creatures and so on. But if you're, if basically what you're saying is, hey, I'm wired to seek other, you know, the, the, the well-being of, of other people. And so, you know, I try not to hurt people and stuff like that. Uh, prove to me that God is necessary for that. Uh, that's not what we're saying. We're saying if you, no. we're assuming that you guys mean something beyond that, right? We're assuming that when you say uh, that you shouldn't torture old ladies for fun, we are assuming you mean something beyond, you know, I was wired by, you know, biological processes to not like that sort of thing uh, because it, it conflicts with my herd instinct. We're assuming that you mean something beyond that because if you don't if all you mean is no that's the way i was you know that's kind of what i was i was wired to do again what do you do with people who are wired to do massively horrible things how is it more right for you to follow your wiring 
and wrong for them to follow their wiring. If you say it's right for you to follow the way you're wired and wrong of them to follow the way they're wired, then you're appealing to some standard that's beyond your wiring and you don't have that. All right, what do you, what do you have to say about this? I would say a lot of this section here is more about moral. What he's what he's explaining is moral epistemology. Sometimes he's he's moving into normative ethics. He's saying that you know like we have these sort of desires to want to sort of survive. Yeah, but that would be moral epistemology. So, but again, and I would even say that more that uh, our ability to want to survive is not the same thing as what we mean by maximizing well-being mm -hmm. in morality in general. So, th take the example of Dirk Willems. Have you heard of the of Dirk Willems? Nope. He was a guy who escaped from prison, and a guard ran after him and fell into the ice. Willem saw this, turned around, and went around and saved his life. The enemy soldier then arrested him, took him back to prison, and executed him a few days later. Willems would have survived if he would have just let the mm -hmm. guy die. But it was immoral, in his view, to let that guard die. Mm -hmm. It was better to be moral and then be executed a couple days later. So morality is something different than survival. Mm -hmm. If I saw a tiger trapped and was being is suffering, I may want it may be the moral thing to do to release the tiger, even if the tiger kills mm -hmm. me. It may be moral, you know, what 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 we do to survive mm -hmm. is different than what morality is, and it sort of just sort of reduce all of moral ontology to what uh, what we what is going to help us survive is really. It's an over oversimplification. Mm -hmm. Morality is much more complicated yeah. than that. And, and I would agree. And that's actually something I, I didn't bring it up, but I was thinking that earlier when he was talking. I was thinking of examples where, uh, you know, you could be wired to do one thing and be wired to do something else. And they're 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 both right. But what do you do when they're in conflict? So, um, in other words, what, what happens when you have uh, two moral views, but they're in conflict? So what I mean here, ladies and gentlemen, is. Suppose uh, you're you're walking down the street and you see uh, a building is on fire and a woman runs out and she says, my baby is trapped uh, in that burning building, All right? So you have, you're wired, you're wired and you have a moral responsibility to seek your own survival to, you know, you, you, you have a vested interest in self-interest. Um, but let's say you're also wired to have a kind of herd instinct where you want to help out the rest of the species. Um, what do you do in that situation, right? What do you do in a situation where, uh, you know, you'd have to put your own life at risk in order to run into this building and try to save this baby? Um, what you could say is, you know, well, you, you should you know, maybe, hey, you're you're older, you know, I'm talking about from a strictly biological maximizing well-being perspective that, you know, the baby's got more years ahead of him or something like that. But it, it seems to me the only the only thing you could do here is is try to do a calculation. What are the odds that the baby is alive and is going to be more valuable to society, to helping other people than I am? And if if the baby does have a better, you know, a good chance of survival and is going to be a better, you know, a better, uh, you know, uh, feature of society than I am, then I should go save the baby. But I think a lot of us would say, no, you need to go try, if you need to go try and save the baby, unless you're sure that the baby's dead, you, you should run in there and try to try to save the baby. And we would say, uh, we would say that you just, that's just a moral thing to do. And even if someone went in and died, you would still say he did, you know, he did, he was he was trying to do the right thing and he was doing the moral thing but notice that would be that wouldn't that wouldn't be simply going with you maximizing well-being right you, because you know if you, let, let's suppose you thought there's a a 30% chance that this baby is alive right because uh, you look up there and you see all these flames you say you th you think there's a 30% chance that you might get in there get the baby and make it out alive and you think there's a 70% chance you're just going to die I think a lot of us would say you should go ahead and try anyway to save that baby and that that's the moral thing to do. And that if you don't, well, we might understand it. We might be able to, you know, people might be able to sympathize, but uh, you, you, you didn't do the moral thing. So anyway, what do you think? Any thoughts yeah. on this? No, I would just say like, here's the thing. If the reason we desire to do to maximize well-being comes from biology, that would at best just explain moral epistemology. Mm -hmm. If if evolution is true and that's how we evolved to get to that point, you could just say, well, God evolved us in a direction to get to us at that point so that we can understand morality. Just like you could say we evolved to understand mathematics. That doesn't mean mathematics is a social construct. Mm -hmm. it, just like we evolved to understand science. That doesn't mean science is a social construct. Just because that's how we understand or we how we came to learn what morality is 
that doesn't mean that's all that morality mm -hmm. is. It's just how we came to understand about it. So just try to say, well, these are just biological instincts that we have. Mm. So <laughs> it doesn't really get to the point of what philosophers are talking about when they get, well, what, what do we mean? What do we mean by ethics? What mm -hmm. is morality objective? Is it not? Is it just something we've constructed? Is it something we've discovered? It's a little different there. So I don't. And again, it, it, this has nothing to do with God. It, so the whole our, the whole challenge as a non-starter is trying to get God out of there and saying we don't need God there. And it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, but we know. When we're talking about normative ethics or moral epistemology, we never claim we need God. It comes to down to the fact is that the moral argument strives or basically is a function of moral ontology. It never had anything to do with these other branches. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, it's... 1022, so uh, we don't want to go definitely past 1030. So let's go ahead and uh, play the rest of this video, and then we'll give our uh, our final thoughts on all of this. You've got is a better explanation, and you might even be right. But you can't insist that he's necessary in such an explanation. So Christians, you have your challenge. If objective morality exists, is written on our hearts, and requires a God for explanation, I look forward to reading your answers. But if you can't think of any, maybe the requirement for God to explain the morality we observe is an argument you should stop making. Just a thought. And speaking of maximizing well-being, there's a group of atheist and skeptic YouTubers uh, who are... Oh, actually, it looks like that's the end. It looks like he's uh, advertising atheist YouTube channels there. But uh, guys, if you want to follow those... Uh, like if you want to follow those atheist channels, then you can uh, you can go over to those atheist channels. I mean, you can go over to the, the Topologia's video. I believe I put the link in the uh, description box. You can click on his video and, uh, and check out those channels. Um, all right. Well, we're done with that video. So what do you think? Massive, yeah. massive misunderstanding here? Again, it's yeah. It's when we talk about why God is required for morality in general, we're talking about moral ontology. And what I've done, what, I, what we talked about last week is I just said if you believe in non-natural moral realism, that just means you believe God exists. They're the same thing. Non-natural moral realism is the same thing as saying God exists. It has nothing to do with normative ethics. It has nothing to do with moral epistemology. It's a moral ontological claim. So I will keep using the moral argument because this just because I you can explain. Any type, any system of normative ethics without uh, referencing God, that doesn't get to the the argument that is the moral argument. Mm -hmm. So I think it just it just misses the mark, unfortunately. And I again, I like Paul. I don't I don't think this is entirely his fault. Mm -hmm. I think some Christians are bad at explaining the moral argument. I think they're bad at explaining meta ethics. And I sometimes I just you know, but again, meta ethics is hard. I was listening to Rousseau Ferlando today, and even he stopped at one point. Mm -hmm. He's an atheist and he's a moral philosopher, and he just stopped and he said. I need to stop because I'm about to say something false. So let me reword this. Even he struggles explaining this mm -hmm. sometimes. It, it moral ethics is a hard subject to explain and study. It is. So I don't. I don't think it's entirely his fault. I just think. But again, I. I, I think we just need to understand that that's not what the moral argument is. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do with the challenge here. Yeah, and uh, maybe uh, I know you've got you, you've got lots of videos dealing with uh, various philosophical uh, issues like this. But uh, yeah, I might make some arguments where. I'm very careful in explaining everything that I mean, because guys, um, I used to teach philosophical ethics at Fordham. Uh, been out of that for a while, so I, you know, I'm not I'm not uh, up to date on the the latest. But it's not like the position, the main positions have changed much uh, in the past ten years. But um, so I taught philosophical ethics at Fordham, and to this day, I cannot understand. I, I have I have no idea. I have no idea how atheists ground ethics. I know the theories. I know the theories that many atheists would adhere to. But when I try and understand how, and when I say atheism here, so so an atheist will say, but that's just lack of belief in God. That doesn't tell you about the rest of my worldview. So I'm using it in the, in the sort of stronger term of stronger sense of naturalism. Um, I cannot fathom how you ground your moral claims and views in naturalism. And so... In that sense, I would I would agree with Frank Turek that you, you seem to be borrowing them from somewhere else and you just don't realize it. Uh, but as far as what Paula Gia was saying, that, you know, as far as what, what we're wired to do, as far as what we're wired to do, if he's just saying, hey, we're wired to do certain things that, that are, you know, that help our species, if that's all you mean by your moral claims, if, if when you say this is wrong, you really mean 
I'm wired to feel like this is wrong, but there's nothing objectively wrong about it, but I'm just wired to feel this way. I would agree. Uh, I, I would I would not base an argument for the existence of God uh, based on that. The assumption here is that you mean something more than that, and atheists generally do. And notice, you have to. You have to. When you start complaining about this or that thing that other people have done, or when you start... When you start uh, condemning God for not doing this, when you say God ought to have revealed himself or something like that, you're, you're, you're making moral claims and you're saying that our rules would even apply to God. That doesn't seem like something you would get from just the way you're wired to help your species, that you would then be telling God he has to do certain things or that he has a moral obligation to do certain things. So it sounds like you mean something more by your moral claims than, than what we're getting from Apologia here. So uh, the question, again, if, if anyone's not under, if, if you haven't understood a lot of what we said, Guys, the simple claim is when you say something like murder is wrong, what is that? What is the status of that claim? You're making a statement. Are you saying it's your personal preference? Are you saying it's what your society teaches? Are you saying you're wired to think that way? Uh, any of those options, which you could, given, you know, be, you could be an atheist and say, I'm wired to think this way. You could be an atheist and say, uh, this is what my society teaches. That would all be consistent. Um, but if that's where your, your moral claims are grounded, you got some problems here. You have some massive problems. And at the end of the day, I don't think you really believe that, right? I mean, I don't think you really believe, I don't think you really believe that your moral claims are just a matter of society or something like that. You could say that, but I don't think you really believe it. Um, uh, because if so, then you couldn't condemn other societies and so on. All right. Any final thoughts? No, um, no, I'm happy with it. Again, I, I don't think I think the challenge was a whole non-starter. I would say nothing when he, if the challenge was offered to me, and I would say biblical morality, if that even is a thing, is just the exact same thing as maximizing well-being. But that's again has nothing to do with what the moral argument is claiming. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, Apologia, if you're watching this, then we'd like you to clarify some some definitions. Uh, maybe contact some Christian apologists and and say. If and say, hey, here, here's exactly what I mean by this or that, and then come out with, if you get a chance, because this seems to be the route you're going and you want it, you're trying to give accurate uh, you know, arguments and so on, uh, to, to lay out your argument in more careful terms where we're not able to just say, hey, you, you don't seem to understand the difference between moral epistemology and moral ontology, or no, that's not what we mean by objective morality, or uh, what exactly do you mean by Bible morality and stuff. You clear, lay out all your definitions, and then, then you might give us something to, to worry about. If anyone has any questions about metaethics, I have a whole series on my channel on metaethics. I go through an introduction, and then I critique some of the other views like non-cognitivism, error theory, uh, relativism, moral relativism, uh, Sam Harris's view, natural moral realism. And I explain my metaethical position, which is non-natural moral realism. Mm -hmm. And then I also present the moral argument in that series. So that's mm -hmm. one of the playlists on my channels if you want to check it out. That will cover a lot. It should help explain a lot more of what's going on here and what mm -hmm. we mean when we try to say – Morality is grounded in a necessary rational being. And um, yeah, guys, and if so, if you if you're a YouTuber and you want to make videos responding to Christian arguments, it's good to get some of that frame, you know, get some of that groundwork laid out. So uh, yeah, I would say go through, go through, uh, go through that video series and get the terms down, and then formulate an argument, and then someone like. Michael here won't be able to just point out that you you kind of confuse you're kind of confused in what you're talking about, and then maybe we'll have a more a more powerful argument that'll confuse us and make us realize that we're wrong. We're wrong in our in our moral argument. So so again, guys, it's a it's a it's as far as I'm concerned, it's a simple question. What is the status of a claim like uh, you know don't murder or something like that? Don't don't torture old ladies for fun. What what's the what is defend that for me in a way? that is consistent with your worldview as a, as a naturalist, defend it in a way that um, if some other naturalist who didn't agree with you, someone who thought it was fine to kill, uh, should be compelled to accept. In other words, there's something on your worldview that you can say. He, see, because of our, uh, our worldview, we know that this moral claim is true. That's what I'd, I'd like to see, but I've never seen it, never seen anything close to it. All right. All right, Michael. All right. Until next time, I believe I'm going to be back with Michael uh, once we get closer to Christmas. I think I'm going to do a couple live streams on. <laughs> one, of my, on. one of my pet peeves. Yeah. On Christmas. Is it a pagan holiday? 
Is it immoral for Christians to celebrate Christmas? We're going to be dealing with these questions for all you Grinches and Scrooges out there. We'll be getting oh that soon. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, that's so annoying. But, yeah, I will totally go through every single tradition with you. All right. We are doing that. All right. Catch you guys later.